Don't you feel so much better? Yes. Since you laid your burdens down. Yes. Has everyone laid their burdens down or you need your burdens laid down? So come to the altar if you need your burdens laid down. Because it's all right in the house this morning, isn't it? So he's a burden bearer. He'll help you. Let's give the choir another hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. I heard something different in these melodious voices. Lord, have mercy. I'm trying to kind of hold my peace here a little bit. Amen. God is so good. Yeah, see, we try to wear this stuff and it gets in your way. Lord, have mercy. Help us. Again, we're so grateful for God's goodness and his blessings. As we have shared this month, again, uh, we're grateful for all the wonderful things God is doing in our lives. Amen. So good to see you and especially you. All of us are somebody in Christ. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. I want to talk quickly out of the book of Nehemiah on today. Old Testament. Old Testament. Uh, if you will remember when I first came here and I sort of uh, designed a uh, formula of, of ministry that I felt was inspired by God, it was the formula that he gave me was out, uh, born out of the book of Nehemiah some of the successes that I believe we are having and will yet have. And so as we continue to work in that book, uh, we plan to continue to uh, devise and implement some of the things that happened in the book of Nehemiah. Out of the book of Nehemiah, I will be reading from the sixth chapter. I'm reading from a King James Version. Just want to talk about one or two things here today as God bless, has blessed us. Amen. Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, everybody have it? All right, I shall start reading at the 15th verse of that sixth chapter. And the word of the Lord reads, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us uh, saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes. For they perceived that the work was wrought of our God. Can I read that again? So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen, that were about us saw these things. They were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought by our God. Amen. I want to talk this morning from this thought, just to cast out a little seed and a little bread. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Let us pray. Father, you're worthy. And we thank you again for your blessings and your mercy. It's not I, but it's the Christ. Speak for thy servant here. In the thank you in advance for what your word will accomplish. In the name of the Lord. We count it done in Jesus' name. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. When I got up this morning, Brother Lamont, I was singing that song, Ordinary People. God uses ordinary people. I remember when I first got saved, if you will allow me just to go here for a moment. I remember uh, when I first got saved, not being raised 
in a, a, a saved atmosphere, in a churchy atmosphere. I thought it took, you know, a particular kind of people to do particular kind of things. And I know that, you know, education and all of that is needed. I, I do know that. I do know that. And I, and, and I encourage that. But, but I used to think that because of my lack of education, that I would not have the ability to do some things. And so what happened, it affected my self-esteem. But not only that, where I came from, it sort of affected my self-esteem and how I viewed myself and how I saw myself. And so I used to think that there were just some places that I would never do, that I would never go, and there were some things that I possibly would never do strictly because of the mindset that I had about myself. And thanks be unto God, as time passed on, after receiving him into my life, he began to minister to me and show me that there's extraordinary things that you can do uh, in your lifetime for me, as long as you realize I'm the one in charge. And so for all of those who have careers, I'm proud of you, want you to continue, but it's the, your foundation is really God. That's your true foundation. You want to be successful, know the Lord in all that you do and all that you accomplish. And so as God began to uh, stretch me out a little further, I began to walk by faith and trust him for what he wanted to do in my life. That's what I want you to do is grab hold of that faith and that trust. I'm yet trusting him because I believe there's other places that I will go as well and do greater things as well. So I wonder, will you come go with me on that journey and take that trip with me? So let's look at the text very, very carefully. You know, many of us have read this. We probably have had it in Bible study. We've had it in Sunday school, the book of Nehemiah. Very, very good book for planning. Very, very good book to refer back to if you want to come up with a plan of action for any type of ministry. And so when we look at the text very, very carefully, you will see uh, from various chapters how Nehemiah, as, as, as a leader, sort of conducted himself. And so when you look very, very carefully, just briefly, I just want to tell you, he was a cupbearer and the Bible and history says that he took care of the king. And we know that cupbearers had very, very crucial and critical responsibilities because what they were to do was to make sure that they uh, had discerned and was able to discern anything that would be evil or would be wrong concerning the king. And so the cupbearer also would sip his drink to make sure that if anything was in it or any poison or anything was in it, then he would die first before the king would die. And so it was a great responsibility in being a cup bearer. Amen? And so, you know, it is important, you know, if we want to be whatever, it is very important that we be committed to what we're about. And so the Bible says that he was concerned because word came to him that Jerusalem lie in waste and that there was problems back in Jerusalem because history says that there were three returns, remember, after captivity. After those 70 years, there were a group of people who had been bruised and had their spirits were broken, having to come back to Jerusalem. And then when they went back to Jerusalem and saw the condition and saw, you know, temples, saw the walls down, uh, you know, it didn't help the situation much. And so here, when you look at these people who were broken and at one time had, had, was weary in Babylon and had, had wondered at times, was the Lord with them? Yes, he was with them. But, you know, you know, sometimes when we go through for so long, sometimes we wonder, are you there, Lord? But he is always there. You must know that. And so the Bible says that here they go back to Jerusalem and, you know, they, they, they're weary on the journey. And Nehemiah got word of the condition of Jerusalem. And the Bible said he approached the king in the right manner. I'm here to tell you, you ought to respect leadership. I just want you to know that. I wanted to inject that in. Whether it's the one you want or not, you are to respect leadership. Isn't that right? And so the Bible says he had a lot of respect for the king. And the, so much respect that the king recognized on his face that there was a problem. That there was trouble. And so the Bible says that the king addressed Nehemiah. He addressed him. In other words, what's wrong? 
And so, you know, that relationship they had, he was honest with the king and said, there's a problem back in my hometown. There's a problem back in Jerusalem. I'm concerned about it. I got message that there was a great need back in Jerusalem. Will you permit me to go and, and, and de- redevelop what needs to be re- redeveloped back in Jerusalem? So nevertheless, you know the story. The Lord made a way through the king and others as he went on his journey to try to get back to, Jeru- uh, get back to Jerusalem. And what happened ultimately when he got back to Jerusalem, the Bible says that he got in a private and a secret place and he began to map out the land and look at the land and assess the situation. You see what I'm saying about a good plan of action? Assessing situations is so important if you're going to have good planning. You've got to look at feasibility. You have to look at whether it's going to work or not. You have to do all of those things before you jump in the water and drown. Amen. He assessed the town and he began to he assessed Jerusalem and began to look and see the condition. He got in his secret closet and began to pray to the Lord and talk to the Lord. I wonder how many are really praying about the direction that we are to go in. I wonder how many are really fasting about the direction that we are to go in. I wonder how many really how many are really connected to the direction that we ought to go in. I wonder how many are really with us as we're trying to do kingdom work, for this is kingdom work. So the Bible says ultimately, as he goes back to Jerusalem, and he began to, again, assess assess the situation, and began to meet with different individuals that were there, meet with the leaders, meet with the rulers, and and, and talk about the situation that that was going on. The Bible says here you had a group of people again that, that, that needed to be encouraged and needed, you know, a word, uh, you know, of comfort, needed, needed that strategic planning to let them know that every one of them was very, very vital and important in the body of Christ. Every one of them could play roles in the body of Christ. So when you look at the text, you will see that he strategically made a plan for them to get down to, should I say, business and get the work done. How many of you know we don't have a lot of time to be fooling around and joking around and we don't have a lot of time to be wasting around with a lot of nonsense and things that should not be going on in the body of Christ. And so the Bible says, oh God, I feel something staring on the inside of me. The Bible says that he got those people together and those that he had to rebuke and those that he had to chastise, those that he had to get in place, he got them in place. Amen? He made sure that everything was going to flow all right. But it's one thing, you know, when you try to get the people together and strengthen their hand, and then when you have outside sources that's always trying to inject their opinion and inject what they see is needed rather than those that are internally being coming together and understanding that it's a united front together and that we should be together on what we do. That way, when outsiders come in to try to discourage us in any kind of way, then we will be cohesive enough and we will be collective enough to know how to send the enemy back out when he comes. So the Bible says that there was uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, you know, men that thought they had clout and had a little posture well known that they could come and try to uh, weary those that were already kind of weary. But this great leader learned how to strategically encourage those people and let them know God's with us. Look in the third chapter, you will see that. The Lord has spoke to me, he said, and said, it's a good work that we're doing. And he said, he would be with us if we would just go on and do the work, if we get get ourselves together and do the work. That's what he told them, amen? And so when you saw the chart, you would see although the enemy came and although the enemy tried to disturb them, remember, in one area of the text, uh, uh, Nehemiah said, I'm on the wall and I cannot come down because this work is important. This is a work for the Lord. It is not about me. It is not about my will. It's not about what I want, but it's really about what the Lord wants. If they got a vision, come connect it to me so that we can get the vision together and move it forward for the Lord. Because if he gave you a vision, then it should connect to what I see. It should not be separate, amen, everywhere else. It should be, a, you know, unity and it should be together. Isn't that right amen oh yes yes okay we won't shout today we shouted already as a matter of fact and 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 so 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 
so, so what happened was, you know, th th you know th th there were some things that had to be straightened out internally so that that internal process could be straightened out, okay? And so what he does, he calls those people together, these ordinary people, these people who came back with less than they went in with, amen? And they would have been able to keep it if they would have just obeyed the Lord. But still, the Lord was with them and he was re ready to restore all back to them. He was really ready to do that. All he ever asked them to do, all he ever asked us to do is live holy, keep his statutes, live right, and follow his guides, follow his direction, follow his route. That's all he asked them to do because he said, you're my people, you're a holy people. He said, I love you. He said, I love you and I have given you favor in the land. I blessed you that you might move forward. So the Bible said eventually they got themselves together. How do we get ourselves together? Just ordinary people. How do we, you know, allow God to use us as ordinary people? How do you view yourself in terms of what God wants to do in your life? How do you see yourself? You're God somebody and you are special in the eyes of the Lord. So the Bible said, are you with me? I know it's getting a little warm. I, I, I see people getting a little sleepy. See, we're going to have to shout after the message. We're going to have to shout after the message, not before the message. Amen. I know it's a little warm in here. Okay? All right. So, so let's see what happens. The Bible says after they got themselves together and they were able to root out all of the problems that existed and all of the little, little schisms and all the little cliques and all the little groups and all of those that felt that they were special and could not work and all of those that felt that, you know, uh, you know we're a royalty, so let somebody else do it. All of those, after he finished straightening out those things in the congregation, the Bible said they put their hands together and you saw that in the sixth chapter of the Bible said that what they did they got themselves together and when you look at the history of that wall you would wonder how in the world did they build that wall in 52 days the Bible said now I'm not here to uh, uh, debate any theological persuasion I'm not here to debate I believe he's a God that can do all things I believe if you get people unified together it, it, I think anything can happen if he reduces Gideon's army you know from 32,000 down to 300 men and 300 men fight a battle what can he do with two or three who get on one accord and can get the ministry moving and get the ministry rolling if the 22,000 step down and then reduce the 10,300. God is a powerful God and he can do that. Don't you know that? Don't you know he will use whom he choose and he will refuse whom he chooses to refuse because what he wants is cooperation and he wants obedience. That's what he wants. They got themselves together and they began to build that wall and they build that wall well, amen. And the Bible said when the enemy heard that they decided to get themselves together. Don't y'all know that there are some things that you can straighten out yourself. Isn't that right? If you started it, you straighten it out. Isn't that Lord, watch out up in here. You, you started it? Come on, come on, come on. You, you can straighten some of this stuff out. Isn't that right? So the Bible said they put them ha their hands together and they began, oh yeah, I know everybody looking at me mighty, mighty funny here. Lord, have mercy. Because we, we want to straighten out some things because we want our hands strengthened so that we can go ahead forward. Isn't that right? So that we can move on out in God and do what he said. When their enemies heard about that, you're somebody that you always have naysayers. That's going to have something to say with the naysayers. And the enemy heard it, but listen, they heard about it, but look what the word of God said. The word of God said when they looked at it, they understood, even the heathen, that wait a minute, hold on one, one thing now. These are God's people. Now listen, God showed up for these people. And when they saw that this was a work that was wrought by the Lord, I don't want no credit for anything. I want God to get the credit out of our lives. I want God to get the credit. If you never call my name, if you never know my name, I want God to get the credit out of my life. And so when they heard that, they recognized that it's God. I'm here to tell you all today in Jerusalem, United Holy Church of America, it is God. It is God. It's his appeal and it's his call. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. What is ordinary? Ordinary is the norm. Ordinary is the normal thing that you do just day in and day out. But extraordinary things are those things that go beyond the ordinary. Those are those things that, no, you can't see it, but by faith you walk into it and trust God to prove all that he has planned. Okay? And so listen, listen, yes, it's right extraordinary things we can do those extra how do we do it we get ourselves together we unite ourselves we unite ourselves we unite ourselves one 
They united themselves. They got themselves together. This strategic leader was very, very smart. And then two, they prayed. They fasted. They went before God. Some of us can't go a half a day with a fast. Now, I'm not talking about medicine. I'm, we, I know we need medicine, but I'm just saying. Fasting. How do we get these things to what? Fasting and prayer. Okay? So they fasted. They knew they could not do it by themselves. They knew they needed a divine plan from God. And when they relied on that, you know, they knew that they could get the job done along with their leader. Amen? Along with their leader. Amen? Along with... So the Bible said, and I'm, I'm done, I'm done. So unity one, prayer two, fasting three. And then guess what he had to do? They had to weed out all the sin and the unrighteousness. I wonder how long would it take to plow all that out? Lord, help us. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things for God. And so I'm here to tell you today, you can do extraordinary things, but you must see beyond the periphery of your eyeball. And you must be able to see what God has designed in that word right there. And, and I'm, I'm ready to take my seat. But do you remember when, when, when the children of Israel left out of Egypt? Do you remember what the Lord told them right before they left? They were in bondage for over 400 years. But God told them something before they left out of Egypt. He said, what I'm going to do, he said, I want you to go borrow. I, I'm, I'm going to give you favor. Just, just go ahead. I'm not talking about borrow money and all that, y'all. Don't get in no debt. But he, he said, because he was getting ready to liberate them from bondage. He said, what I want you to do, he said, from your neighbors and get some things. I, I want you to go because what I've already done, I've already cleared the way. And do you know when they left out of Egypt, they were wealthy. They were wealthy just by being obedient. I keep saying this is a wealthy place. This is a wealthy place. This is a wealthy place for many, many reasons. Because of its history, its foundation, its leaders, it's a wealthy place. And the word that have been, you know, instilled in the hearts and minds of people, it's a wealthy place. And so I say to you today, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Young people, you can be inventors. You don't just have to be basketball players. Or foot and it's wonderful, I know your sports, uh-oh, I just hit somebody there. Sports is fine. That's fine. I'm not knocking it. But I'm saying that those are not the only occupations. There are other occupations. There are other occupations. Inventors. You know, the envision things and create. So ordinary people can do extraordinary things. So if you feel, you know, you want prayer, we're going to have prayer right quick and we're going to let you go. You know, I feel something extraordinary coming my way. You know, now, you know, Minister Kelly, I do. Yeah, I do. Something extraordinary coming my way. So we're going to open the altar. It, it, don't feel that you're less than anybody. Don't feel that, you know, whatever you've done, I want you to just come. Just come on and let's have prayer. Because you can do extraordinary things. Get your mind together. Get your thoughts together. And come to the altar you're invited to.